All right, the date is wrong. <laughs> Next up, we have Rihards talking about Go IT, European funding for free and open source silicon, I think. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> so before we start, I want you to have an idea in the background of your head because uh, before I explain what we are about. And um, especially this slide, kind of have this thought in the background of your head about sustainability, about raw resources, about how much actually resources we need to create chips and so on. But um, basically this is a view that I present to you. The idea is that you can view semiconductor industry in many ways and this is how I see it, you know. And one of the ways to see it is in the terms of these productivity leaps or bumps, yes. So one can imagine that in the beginning the the people who actually did IC design was quite limited, the number of people, you know. Mostly those were physicists. And then came a book, like Introduction to LSI Systems. Uh, it kind of split the process and suddenly you have surplus of people coming from university and being able to design more and more circuits, you know. So there's more innovation, more productivity, which is again quite cool. <laughs> You can also think of EDA, EDA tools as a similar productivity bump. So continuously they're improving. We are improving our productivity. We can do more and more designs, more and more transistors, which is again cool. And many of people here are actually working on free tools, right? So kind of breaking the oligopoly of tool vendors. Again, if you think in the long term, it brings a lot of productivity. One of my favorite examples is TSMC. So they brought a new business model, fabulous business model. So Chang, uh, uh, the idea was not new at the time, but he was the one who convinced his government to actually change something, to invest into TSMC. Uh, but the thing is, nobody believed him at the moment, yes, but uh, now, as you know, they have the most advanced node in the world, which is, again, cool. And again, more and more people were able to do chip design, more productivity, and so on. So finally, ARM in my opinion, also gave a lot to the industry with the standardization. So if you think about system on chip as it is, there's uh, one of the most important things in my opinion is the standardization of the interfaces. So you can have different groups around the world creating different IPs, different peripherals, and you can integrate them in a single SOC. Again, very cool, uh, very nice. And here we can stop and think like, a natural question to ask ourselves is what is the next big thing, next big leap in the productivity, right? And um, here quite arrogantly, I must say, I added our project logo here, like the next leap is us. Of course, no, <laughs> I'm joking. The next leap is actually kind of uh, this conference, you and this open source community. It might be, we don't know. And uh, the thing is that indeed, maybe the next productivity kind of gain comes from openness, from tool availability, from the thing that more and more people can check the designs and work, play around, and bring even more innovation, yes. So opening the PDKs, and maybe we can come up with solutions to improve IP, IP reusability, and, and so on, yeah, so. And basically, GoIT project, um, works with this, yes. So I'm the coordinator, in fact, of the project, so we are a small team. Uh, I'm a uh, senior researcher at the Institute of Electronics Computer Science in Latvia, yes, so uh, many of these people here are probably your friends, yes. Uh, uh, we have also Free Silicon uh, Foundation, there's also like uh, SME, maybe many of you know Staff, who works also with Aramat a lot. And, um, Basically, we have a couple of, let's say, uh, contributions or uh, things that we must do or should do according to the grant agreement, let's say. <laughs> um, so this is a coordination and support action. So research is a relatively small, po small portion of what we do. And to summary, all the contributions, we are developing hardware license, so we're actually procuring lawyers to develop a hardware license applicable in many uh, uh, countries. Uh, we work with certification and standardization, that's why, hence my question earlier, because one of the things that in new standards, maybe open source should be in the core of the new standards, and it should be, and it is not, <laughs> I can assure you. <laughs> so we work on the opening uh, process uh, development kits, but sadly it's not, there's nothing much I can share here. 
Also, we have a group in Spain that works also on root and trust. Uh, project also funds uh, FSIC conferences. So, uh, last conference, uh, these conferences are also organized by the partners of the project. Um, and then there are two things that I want to talk more about. So, it's hub of open source uh, at the software and hardware libraries. So, this is something that where I'm more involved. And probably the most important thing that we do, in my opinion, is road mapping and feedback to policy makers. <laughs> so here I want to uh, have a quick survey. Yes, just let's raise the hands, and I'm really interested in how it will go on. So the first question is really easy. <laughs> Who has heard about the European Ships Act? Cool, very good. So the next question is, who has read the European Ships Act? Okay, nice. Thank you. Four people in the room. That's cool. <laughs> Sorry? Ah, okay. <laughs> no, but, okay, I wanted to ask the next question. So it's probably for these four people or people who know something more about it. So who generally agrees with what's written in the CHIPS Act? Okay. What I mean to say, you of course will not agree with all the points, right? But maybe you agree with the spirit of it? Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> the spirit. <laughs> um, um, as my colleague said, it's uh, very idealistic, you know, and maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's supposed to be, but it has lots of flaws. And we in this project have an opportunity to actually give feedback about the CHIPS Act. I know it's already voted in the parliament, it's already making big change in funding, but uh, you can change annexes, for example, you ch can change KPIs of the CHIPS Act. And uh, uh, so basically, maybe one of the things that encapsulates, in my opinion, CHIPS Act very well, so there are lots of objectives, but uh, to give some background, CHIPS Act, although many people talked about long ago, it kind of came out of COVID you know, because of the supply chain interruptions and we have to be resilient and tools have to be resilient uh, and so on. So here another question arises, like could free and open source principles help to solve this objective, you know, objective of resilience? How do you think? Could it help? Of course, right? So there's not even, it's not even mentioned in the whole document. The only time open shows in the European Chips Act, it uh, refers to open foundries that have nothing to do with open source and, and free silicon. So, hmm, uh, let's try to connect the dots here. So why did it happen? Like, how come did this happen? Yes. Ah, it's in the handbook. Ah, okay. Yeah, but it's, doesn't it, isn't it strange that it doesn't appear in the legislature? Sorry? You pay. Uh, well, we can have a discussion on it, but I have an argument here. Have you seen this uh, image? Maybe. So one of the things the CHIPS Act mentions is uh, we will make the tools available to everyone with cloud-based solution. There will be a virtual design platform. So usually when we ask people, do they agree with it? Uh, it's half and half. One half says that, yeah, that's a good idea because actually you can, as uh, I think you said yesterday, you can use uh, machine learning algorithms. You can improve a lot of things. But uh, other companies, especially like somewhat bigger companies, they say that, no, I will never upload my IP to some cloud <laughs> that I don't have access to. Right. So this is, in fact, an um, image from a um, working group uh, kind of document, which is kind of answer to the CHIPS Act. And uh, if you look at the authors of the document, these are the authors. And uh, isn't, is there anything strange here? Do you see anything? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it seems that all the, we are talking about oligopoly of the tools, right? So they are all here. They actually made this kind of answer, suggestion to the, what they should do. And that's a basically, I think, most important thing what 
we and GoIT can do. This is why we are here. We are actually writing like uh, the li like deliverable report to the European Commission, so they will actually read it. So if you have any feedback, any ideas, we can in fact change the policy of Europe or at least change it slightly. You know. So this is basically the biggest point I wanted to make and uh, not to make it so depressive, so we still have a chance. Uh, this is a nice picture from the last FSIC conference uh, in Paris, and this is a slide presented by Harald Prettel. And uh, this is, in fact, the first, uh, I think, to my understanding, it's the first uh, mixed signal chip designed purely with open source tools, simulation and everything. So it wasn't easy. You can uh, watch his uh, video on this presentation, but that's something I think really impressive. So it is possible, right? Um, and the other topic I just want to touch upon it here because I think there's lots of experienced people here, lots of experienced developers here, and so maybe we can have more discussions. It's about silicon IP reusability. So even uh, during these uh, days, these discussions, these presentations, you can hear all the time that Maybe there's some solution, but nobody can kind of use it, or it uses different interfaces, there, there's no standard, and maybe there even can't be. So this is one of the challenges that we are also kind of tackling in GoIT project. And um, here, basically, I put some of the challenges that people usually nod their heads about, you know? <laughs> like, uh, okay, at the IP core level, it's maybe clear, but at lower levels, it's always the matter of interfaces, you know. Each group has their own kind of understanding how to join IP together, and that's like uh, always an issue. Uh, what we've seen, there's lots of diversity of high and low level uh, design approaches. Yes, so there's Verilog, VHDL, systems, he, you know, system Verilog, but then there are hardware construction languages. There's uh, one, one of <laughs> the press there, but I mean, everyone, are kind of sure about their solution, you know? Everyone doesn't want to change, that's kind of natural. But that's also a challenge just for people to be more productive, you know? Um, there's also, of course, challenge of reusability of non-RTL, yes, uh, designs. Then uh, there's design quality, so we heard about Libre course, open course, which uh, I think had this kind of challenge. And then there's always, I think it's like a wider principle in open source, it's about top-down versus bottom-up approach. So everyone who gets to this challenge starts with top-down approach. You know, we'll say how it must be. <laughs> this is the principles. This, uh, these are the, how you should document it. These are the interface, but indeed it never works, right? Open source doesn't work like that. If something is good, it succeeds and people start using it. So this is one of the things that we are also trying to do in the GoIT project, and we basically are in the first year after our, um, uh, let's say, initial kickoff, and uh, we are now kind of trying to develop or will develop a solution uh, that kind of tries to at least partially solve or improve this kind of part of the open source uh, uh, RTL, mostly RTL designs. So we plan to create a kind of it's a concept, but the idea is about the reference repository that uh, basically the general principle is reducing this friction for developers to actually do anything, you know. So there are many, like, multiple dependency solvers that we use, yes. FuseSoc today was the more popular one. Uh, and yeah, we'll see how it goes, but if you have any ideas, because I see there are lots of experienced people here, just uh, come and talk with me, yes. Um, anyways, that's about it. Go IT. And uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Sorry. Hello. I reckon there will be some questions. All right. First up, can talk. Um, so thank you for this presentation. So I don't have a question, but uh, I have a comment because so my name was also in the list of the working group uh, members. <laughs> uh, so uh, so the, the working group, uh, so the idea of this uh, virtual design platform is to enable uh, startups uh, to uh, get access to tools, to get access to IP, uh, to PDKs. Um, and uh, it's not said that uh, it must be a, a commercial uh, tools and commercial PDKs. So the way how the virtual design platform is structured is that there will be uh, instances, and uh, each instance can be run by 
a, um, let's say, a design services company. So, for example, there could be an instance which uh, serves uh, Global Foundry 22 nanometer process. Um, so that means that uh, if uh, now an open source company uh, wants to run such an instance and offer uh, open source solutions to startups which are going to use this platform, so they are free to do so. So, um, so we are not excluding uh, open source by any way, but uh, if, uh, if there's an initiative which uh, wants to be part of this platform, so uh, absolutely welcome. Uh, so the calls for this uh, platform will be issued uh, end of November, because then this uh, CHIPS uh, joint undertaking will start, which will fund the platform. And uh, so then, uh, so there is, uh, so I, I don't see why uh, uh, open source initiatives could not apply for, the, for this call, so also to get uh, some funding for participating in the platform. Thank you. Uh, that's a good comment. <laughs> Well, yeah, so like open source is not mutually exclusive. Oh, yeah. sorry, proprietary stuff is not mutually exclusive with open source solutions. It sounds like it's all together. Yeah, what I would maybe comment here, I think that's like the only answer to the uh, chip side. Like there's no other, I, I'm not aware of any other document made by any other committee or work group. And uh, maybe like that's something that I would like to, like I think there should be, you know, yeah, for the sake of discussion. Uh, I, I didn't want to interrupt again, but I was going to say again in that list, you got uh, Romano and Martin from IMEC who have been very supportive of Chipflow and open source in general. Um, you know, and there was uh, you know, one of Romano's, um, Romano has a team member working directly on uh, the open source side of things. They were at uh, FSIC this, year, this, uh, this, June, this June just gone. So, yeah, there's uh, this. this there's a lot of interest in the EU around open source in this space, and uh, and we should all be making sure that we're, our voices are heard and that they know that these options are out there. Um, and you know, Anton's a, a good person to talk to. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Which is which is? Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll maybe. I also up. have a question. So <laughs> yes, other questions. Is it, Everybody can kind of leverage each other's solutions, right? So look at the open road funding from DARPA, all that stuff is being, we've got Andrew in the front row there. Um, it sounds like Europe is not gonna spin up their own open road, right? Um, so everybody benefits from all of the FOSS outputs of each continent's CHIPS Act, I suppose, the US one and the European one. And perhaps should not Europe pick where it can add the most value and not repeat work that might be happening in the US or elsewhere? Is, it, is that something that you would propose? Um, yes and no. I think like um, um, people's thoughts about it differ. Um, I think indeed there is collaboration between uh, both like US and European CHIPS Act. It's an, an official thing. But um, I think that many people also kind of feel manipulated, you know. Um, by, I know, uh, it's maybe difficult to say it, but uh, basically there are different views on it. And uh, of course, it's a kind of maybe not, of course, it's not correct to do the same work again and again, but actually you kind of see it also here, right? Like people do the same thing to kind of get the best out of it. Yeah, but at the scale of a Verilog parser, not at the scale of a PNR tool. Um, yeah, I, I uh, like if you have a proposal for something, yeah, we can put it in the document. So the, probably the starting point would be the awareness. Like there shouldn't be an, any new initiative or anything without awareness. And it seems that sometimes that's the case. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one question about, uh, I actually had the same uh, question as Julius about uh, glo we are, we are dealing with global businesses. We had a whole list of uh, companies that we showed as our global businesses, except maybe IMAC was, uh, was local uh, to, uh, to Europe. Mm -hmm. The rest, they're playing with all cheap acts in Vietnam, in Bangalore, in, you know, in America, everywhere. In Brazil, the same synopsis will be in, uh, in all initiatives about all EDE tools everywhere. And also, all the list you showed the, the big money businesses, yeah. right? 
So unless you find the business model around the open source, whatever project, open source is nice, but it's not a business. Unless you find the business model around open source, EDA tools, you're not in the list. And so you're not, uh, a, 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 you don't have opinion about to say, is it cloud or not cloud, right? So. Yeah, I think I got your point, yeah. So uh, nobody talk in this conference, everybody mm. talk about some technical stuff, nobody talk about business model. Where, where, how are we gonna find a way to you know, make money on it? Huh? <laughs> I wasn't hearing. Yeah, sorry, uh, there's nothing much to comment from my side. Uh, I think you're correct, but that's not like an easy challenge to solve. I think, like, I would say, there are mistakes uh, sometimes made. So um, we, we need to solve it, of course, but maybe it's more in terms of principles. So there's also, a ch um, I know, like, Cyber Security Act in uh, uh, also, like, it's about this time. So it's like in the final phase, maybe somebody knows it better. But there, um, something like really critical to the security, there's also like no mentioning of open sources. Even more so, there were even bugs made in the, the attack. The idea is that if you publish something with crypto related on the, you, you, uh, in the GitHub, it's like you can be liable or something like that, you know. But basically what I'm trying to say is that, uh, of course the long-term goal is that, but uh, we should do whatever we can do. And so the first thing is like maybe give more environment more understanding to the policy makers themselves yeah of course if uh, one of the things that we try to do in this uh, roadmap the first roadmap we actually try to bring the successful examples of these uh, open source kind of uh, startups that build upon them but there are not that many yeah Christian. Um, you just mentioned github so you end up with a with a hub with a nice documented flow and course and everything, but where would this be hosted? Yeah, the, the, you mean about the last slide basically, yes, about this uh, op reusability. Yeah, the idea is that everyone should be able to host it uh, themselves. If they want to host it on GitHub, please, yeah. Ah, okay, so you mean some sort of distribution? Yeah, 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 the idea is we don't want to constrain anyone because that would not work. Okay, yeah. thanks. <laughs> Can I ask a question? The, um, it's a little bit resounding to this, the, but more the opposite. Like, where do you see a gap in the hardware licenses? Like, I made the bold statement yesterday that we consider the problem solved. So you say the opposite. I'm wondering what. Yeah, uh, like, I'm not. So sadly, this is the moment when I say I'm not like able to comment that uh, part. But uh, you should talk with uh, Luca Alati. I can give you the contacts. Oh, I know Luca. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know him probably. Yes, that's true. One comment is, um, I, I guess, transition models for open source projects to become self-sustaining businesses are fairly well studied. So if you want, we can talk offline. We've studied this problem with, you know, a dedicated embedded entrepreneur actually provided to our project for uh, over a year. So maybe we can chat offline. Um, the other comment is yesterday I mentioned this notion of more wood behind fewer arrows. And so the question earlier was very poignant. Um, will we have five different chips acts around the planet, each trying to develop open source EDA, for example, where database, timer, detailed router are really, really, really difficult. And I've had you know, conversations with Jean-Luc Chapou and others it, it's going to be very difficult to sort of reinvent these wheels, you know, to 30% and then realize it's tough. So it would be, in my opinion, great if, if the door was open to, you know, accepting international participation mutually in these CHIPS Act design enablement platform efforts because I don't really see enough resources to, to cover the need otherwise. It's, personal opinion. But That's a great I've, feedback. I've, I've heard um, yeah. what you said before through many channels that 
you know, there's a, a nationalism or a regionalism yeah. or a, you know, internal security of the EU m motivation for, for not considering external sources, but it may be difficult. <laughs> I think especially if you consider European efficiency, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Got a question uh, from. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Hans. Got a question from Matt. Actually, it was just um, a minor correction. The um, I know from uh, my experience with the Skywater PDK that the first mixed signal chips were done in 2020. I wouldn't be surprised if Harold's was the best performing and best documented. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, but yeah, they've been done uh, at least two years ago and probably on other, probably previously as well. I would have thought. Okay, thank you. I have a question. So in general, I think, because mixed signal is a good thing, right? What I'm wondering, like Skywater is 130, like why isn't there more analog and more mixed signal on it? Because for digital it sucks, right? 130 nanometers is not really relevant if you want to build a product nowadays. But it seems useful if you talk about mixed signal or analog. Why don't we see the influx? Is it just like there's no talent, nobody can do analog? Is it like, Can I it see a great opportunity there, right? It's uh, there is a lot of analog now, but right? like, maybe Matt, you can also comment on it. But. Yeah. It's hard, and it's not my, not many people. Who of do course, it. it's hard, right? But it's like yeah, that's a challenge, right? Doing digital with 130. Yeah, I mean, um, digital is just ones and zeros, isn't it? <laughs> As Bob Woodler said, but it, you have to be able to design an analog circuit and simulate it, and um, and then do the layout, and it's it's way more of a manual flow. The digital flow is you take your FPGA program that you've already tested and then chuck it in. Yeah, but that's, but that's for fun, like taking all the questions together, like the commercial opportunities, we have everything for 130, like why is then, not, like this is the commercial like, opportunity, right? Mix, like, Europe is strong in mixed signal, right? Like that's where we, like we are pri proud of like the domain-based designs that we can do for automotive and everything, blah, blah, blah. We, we are I, not on any media stuff, right? So, I, that's a really good point, Stefan. I think more should be done on that. Um, that's, yeah. a, that's a roll call, because I can't do it. Somebody has to do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if, if anyone's interested, um, Spherical Systems is a European startup that's funded recently, and they're doing analog with um, Sky, with open source tools for space industry. Yeah. It'll be great, like getting USB 2 or USB 3, even 5 for Skywater, mm. right? Like this, like this seems to be something that people should be working on, right? Yeah, and it's the sort of thing as well, you know, like modern high-end HPC cores like Intel, all these guys, they've got hundreds of engineers building these things. A good, high-quality, well-tested, um, silicon-tested, brought up analog IP doesn't take that many people, and it can be extremely valuable and used all over the shop. PMUs, radios, PLLs, all of it. I'm, I'm a bit surprised, actually, there's not, I haven't seen more, but maybe it'll come. Because these open source PDKs, the easiest thing to do is put a risk five on it. Well, not, not easiest, yeah. but like, y you put it on and it's either going to work or it's not and you figure out why not. But when an analog block doesn't work, you can sit there for months and months and just go, oh yeah, this trim is wrong or whatever. Um, it's less sexy, um, but I think it's very important. And I, I think it'll happen. I think slowly it will. That's like, maybe to turn it into a question. <laughs> yeah. Like, did you consider this? Like. Because I, I always hear like there's a lot of, like I'm also part of those projects, right? Yeah. Like there's a lot of European funding, German funding, like everyone funds it now, like it's very hip. Well, German like, is better this, like, at funding it. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Uh, German is better at funding it. But uh, so from my personal um, experience, so first uh, about the analog part, uh, it depends probably also on the complexity, but if you think of functionality like Wi-Fi, there's probably seven teams around the world that can actually make it happen. That's it. Like, what open source are we talking about there? Uh, but uh, otherwise, like in terms of reusability, uh, the conclusion that we came uh, to was that the best, basically, that at the moment you can do is kind of just bring forward the reference, so that other people, if they go in a similar direction, they have like a starting point. But uh, as uh, Matt said, like it's not one and zeros, so it's not described using a RTL language, yes, so uh, HDL language, sorry. Yeah, uh, to my knowledge, uh, Julian, may, maybe you, you're talking about uh, 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 CMOS uh, analog, but uh, uh, working regularly with gallium nitride fab, uh, their design is fab designers in the loop. 
uh, they do in PDK. I mean, th they're really sitting on the fab. So open source would be cool to have open source Gallium nitride fab and sit on it, <laughs> but it's a lot of money. Not, not, not many companies in the world can afford it. And then MEMS, if you're talking about, about analog as MEMS, like it's a completely different process. I mean, I'm not even sure that the MEMS has a PDK. I, I'm mainly talking about just yeah, run-of-the-mill CMOS stuff that we can integrate with our digital circuits. But for example, the IHP 130 is 130 nanometer um, high polar CMOS, right? So that's bipolar instrument. So it yeah, seems like cool. fit, but like, yeah, that's also yeah. what it's designed for, right? Like, yeah. It's for mixed signal, it's not for digital, right? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's assumed that the digital will be okay. Like That's just like make signals, right? <laughs> yeah. I think there are also some additional problems with analog ASICs. Like you need much more elaborate measurement equipment, for example, to characterize a fast ADC or something like this. Then it's not portable. You've designed a nice IP yeah. library, the next technology comes up and you start again from scratch. And um, the third point, no, I forgot it. But <laughs> <laughs> this makes it quite quite difficult, I, I yeah. think. But, but oh yeah, and you're also much more rely on the quality of the of the PDK, I guess. You need really good simulation and good parasitic models to be able to do a good design. Yeah, and, and the point that I was making is like if you see all the public money flowing into open source, why isn't it flowing in the most hard part? Like, and not, like, like this is very provocative, right? But I don't need another risk five core, right? Uh, being taped out, right? Yeah. Like I have seen that it works. <laughs> like, yeah. Accept it. Like this works. I would have known, right? Sorry. There is some money flowing into analog, like the IHP stuff yeah, I, we're working on. I but I guess the main problem is, is that with with analog, there's not really a clear, obvious answer and path forward, right? Which makes it very hard for money to flow into. So I think that's like something we can really work together on as a community. Is like. What is the right answer for analog and, 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 and having like a much more product, productive analog design environment? So I think the stuff Spherical's doing is really important in this space. Um, but you know, I think we need a bit more of a community coming together around what does that actually look like? Looks like the 1980s from what I've seen in Virtuoso, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Sorry, slight. <laughs> Another question. Analog and uh, analog editors are old. Sorry. Uh, it's more a comment on this analog, uh, uh, let's say, sharing and portability. In my, in my experience, I think it, it's not that different from what um, our friend at, at Loris said. I mean, design is probably not the, the hardest part, but verification is huge. So, And I think where the open source community should concentrate is on the portability of test bench and verification and automation environment. Because sometimes you port the analog into a different process. You need to change many things in the design. Maybe sometimes also the topology of the circuit, but verification should stay the same. I mean, specs are the same, so you want to make sure you automate and, and, uh, and, and make sure you can translate into a different process the same requirements and verifying them. So I think the emphasis is not in the design, but more in the verification. Okay. Sorry for steering it away from GoIt. Is there any no. question about GoIt before the break? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> yes. I had one question I almost asked the last speaker. Um, do you consider things like patent pools or other uh, sort of side enablement or collaterals that will have to be um, composed? Or, you know, to be honestly, to not yet. Okay, yeah. but that, that's kind of a Next step, two yeah. steps away kind of barrier that maybe would need to be overcome as well. I yeah. think the OIN is working on something like that, right? Rob, you're involved yeah, with the OIN, yeah? I'm, I'm being <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can ask Rob. Like the OIN, they are working on patent pooling for open source silicon. I know a little bit. Okay, thank you very much. This thank was very really much. fun. Thanks, Rehard. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We should have like a forum session on that. That was a okay, fascinating chat. Okay, we have a break.